So in this series of videos, we're going to work on making something similar to this game here where I can move my player around through a tile map. The player animates in the different directions that I go and I can fire a projectile. We'll be adding in possibly a close combat option as well. Currently we have wandering monsters. We'll be looking at having chasing monsters as well. And the game is also set up so that if you run into the monsters, it gives us a visual feedback of, you know, it turns red as the monster goes away. The white one is more damaging than the other one, so we can see our health is going down pretty bad. I run out of health, and currently the scene restarts. Now, if we can make the scene restart, that means we could just as easily shift our game into... Uh, game over screen, whether it be a win screen, lose screen, etc. So we have different capabilities that we will be adding into this project as we move forward. So right now, it looks like this. We have the player moving, and this is using the tile map information that we had before and the basic code that went with that. As we go into this, we're going to do things a little bit different down the road we could look at using Webpack and uh, Babel and some of these other tools that would help for automating the process so we could now use uh, JavaScript modules, imports, exports, all of that stuff. But right now to keep things a little bit simpler we're going to start dividing our script into multiple files so that we are able to better control the whole um, management so that our code doesn't become too much because when we look at what's happening right now we have a lot going on so this particular game scene it has the player all of the players logic is baked into the game scene so you know that's not really a good construct or way that we want to organize our code so instead what we want to do is separate this out into its own class so that the player is taking care of the player's business. So our main scene just says, hey, I want a new player. Boom, done. And then the play, the game scene can say, hey, player, you know, you can collide with the walls and all that, you know, which it's doing already. And then we can figure out how we want to handle other collisions. So when we have enemies, we can have weapons, all these different things. We'll figure out how to deal with that. We'll use callbacks, etc. as we factor it in. So Starting with this core shell of using a simple tile map. So we're loading in the tile map and we built that using tiled. So we have our tiles graphic. We have the JSON that came out of tiled. And then I have a sprite sheet that I am bringing into this. And the sprite sheet looks like this. So currently I have it set up. I'm using the frames for the slime. We could use the other characters on here if we wanted and we could add that into it as well. Uh, we have the player's uh, weapon that they fire out. We have the particle that we're using for it. Now if I go into the sprites, I have used Texture Packer to write some JSON so that we can work with the skeleton file that has these different frames. So it's just another way of working it and we will explore that as we work through this whole uh, series of videos. So going back into the game scene, we can see that there's a lot of stuff going on here. There's some things that are a little bit different than what we may have done previously, so we will talk about all of them as we start rolling forward with it and separating things out into our appropriate classes. So with this structure, what we're going to do is we're going to add in our base player to get this working. But what we're going to find is that our player, as well as our enemies, are going to have some shared language, some shared code that is part of how they're constructed. And because of that, we can make a parent class that then they are going to extend that class. So when we look at classes here, we can see our game scene extends phaser scene. So then we're going to end up uh, making classes that extend uh, the phaser game object sprite 
class so that it builds upon that and then we can make our player extend on that class our enemies extend on that so then we don't have to then duplicate the code that is part of that so to do that what I can do is go under scripts and I'll say new file and the new file that I'm going to create here will be entity.js I'm just going to minimize assets. I don't need to be looking at that right now. And then class entity will extend. And it's going to extend phaser dot game objects dot sprite. Pay close attention to the capitalization as you put that in. Now we will need our constructor. And when we construct one of these, we will pass in the current scene. We'll pass in an X position, a Y position of where we want this object to start. We'll pass in the texture key we're going to use, and then we're going to pass in the type of entity that we are working with here in it. Now, anytime we extend something, we have to call super. So we'll pass out to the values that are part of um, the sprite class that is present there. Now we can make a reference to that scene that we're passing into it. So anytime we make a new entity object, we pass into it the current scene that we're coming from. So then we can use that reference to that scene inside this class. So this scene is now equal to the scene that we passed in. And you'll notice any of the parameters, they're italicized. And then when we reference them in the code, they show up italicized as well. And now we can tell the scene to add um, this object to it. And then we will tell the scene that we are going to use physics for it and we will enable the body of this sprite and we make a reference to the current object that we're enabling the body on this dot type is going to be equal to type and then finally this dot is dead it's going to be equal to false so we're going to be using this is dead property later on in our code. So instead of having to add the is dead property directly to the class of the player, to the different enemies we work with, if we put it in this parent class, then we don't have to repeat it. We can now know that we have access to it. So anything we put here, we will have access to inside our individual classes. Now that we're done with the constructor, we're going to add a method and this method will be explode so we will call this method when we are done with an object so we'll say if the object is so anytime now inside the class when we use the word this we're referencing this class object for inside game scene when we reference this we're referencing the scene so this is one of those words in JavaScript programming that gets a little bit murky to keep track of sometimes because it is bound to the current set of kind of curly braces in which it is appearing. So that's why we have to be aware of our surroundings. So if we're not dead, then we will set is dead equal to true. And then we are going to eliminate ourselves from the scene. And I like to send a message so we know that it happened. And the message we'll use will be entity explode. So we know what, where that command is coming from. And looks like um, 
ended up with a curly brace that I don't need that or I mean a parenthesis that I did not need okay so that now finishes out my entity so we will come back to this down the road and we'll be adding more and more features to it as we progressively add more content into our game structure now if I go under scripts and say new this time I will say player .js and now we add this into our project so we'll have class player extends entity and now we'll have our constructor and in the constructor we will then reference scene x y texture key so the player object is not going to have as many parameters as say an enemy object where we'll pass in additional things now we reference super and now we can see that we will do scene x y texture key and player now one thing I neglected to put in over here we passed in a texture key so what we can also do here is this dot texture key is equal to texture key so we want to make sure we put that in there so I goofed on that one forgetting to put that in and now what we want to do is we want to go into the game scene now if we look in the game scene okay player there that's fine we can leave that but and now we're going to get into the keyboard and we'll talk about uh, what's going on with the keyboard stuff a little bit later because we've added some instead of just using the cursor keys like we did before like this we're now going to be storing a bunch of key codes and when we store those keys we're adding them in left right up and down but also WASD so that you can use either while you are working so we'll, we'll look at that in a little bit more detail but what we want to do is go down and go find the player section here so currently we're adding the player like this and instead of doing that what we're going to be doing is saying we'll make our statement a little bit different now I do have some other things in here that I'm going to move over into the player because there's no reason to have this information all the animations contained inside the main code so we're going to go grab all of that information that is part of the player so let me go and grab all of that so I'm just going to cut it out of here now we're at end create now I'll go into the player and this is going to be in the player's constructor and we will now paste that in so we're going to set the frame rate and we can decide what we want the frame rate to be for our player as we work with that and how fast we want it to work and what we also are going to want to set up here is make a reference so currently we say this dot anims, but what that really is saying is we want the current scene. So the scene we've passed in, we want its anims to be the reference here because just by saying this, this says the player anims, which the player doesn't have animations. The scene stores the animation information because the animations are just simply saying which texture and which frames we're seeing. Are they repeating and at what frame rate? And then we can tell whatever sprite we want to play whatever animation we want. So we could have even one animation that's just a global, you know, kind of explosion or death animation. And we could reuse that for anything by just saying, hey, I want this sprite to play this animation. So the animations aren't really sprite specific, except that we usually are tying the artwork to a given sprite. So it feels that way, but the reality is it's not. So I'm going to make a variable here. I'll just refer to it as anims because that allows me to cleanly fix my code here. And then I'm going to tie it into the scene we passed in, the scene's anims right there. Now, 
all we have to do is clean things up by getting rid of the word this. So I am alter option dragging, depending on your platform, because that's how we multi-select inside of uh, VS Code. Get a bunch of deletes there, that cleans that up. And now, instead of referencing that, we can say this dot texture key. I'm just going to copy that, which I could have multi-selected, but this is a little trickier one. So I know there's four of these, so I just have to make sure I get all four, otherwise we can get some weirdness happening down the road. Now something else is, as we're doing this, realistically we could generate all of these animations. We could even make an animation class and store it so that we would have a method for generating or creating our animations. And if we were consistent in our naming structure and how our frames were made and everything, we could automate this whole thing. So we just have a method. We just say what I want and it now generates it so we don't have such duplicative code occurring as we work our way through. Now, when we look here, we're gonna set our idle frame. So the idle frame will be the frame that we're using. Now, if we had idle animations, we would have four more idle animations, but this character doesn't. It just has simple three frame loops for each of its different directional walk cycles. So we're working with that. But now when we get further down here, we're in the player class, so we don't need to tell the player to do it. We can just say we want this item to set its frame equal to what we have here. Now, the next thing that we can do as we work our way down is we're going to set an update method. And now inside the update method, this is where we are going to move all of the information that is inside the game scene inside the update. Well, probably, well, actually pretty much all of it because all of the information here has to deal with the player. But we're getting to the point that we've made a lot of code and we probably are going to want to test things before we get too much further just to make sure that things are working as we expect them to work. So currently we say player is going, is we add it as a sprite. But now that we have made a class for this, we're passing in some information to it when we make it. And to make an instance of the class, we just simply say new player. Now, if I just comment that out right there and go here and put the opening, because it is a class and it's saved, it shows me the different items it's looking for. It says scene X, Y, texture key, and it's gonna be a type player. So it's nice that it gives me that code hinting. Now, it doesn't give me better code hinting because it says scene any X, any Y, any texture key, any, because we're using JavaScript. If we migrated to something like TypeScript where we could type those variables, then it would even tell me what kind of information that is expecting for each one of those values. But we're not gonna do that uh, today. So I already have most of what I need here. I can now just simply say this, and this refers to the scene. Remember, you know, anytime we see this, when we're in the scene, we're referencing the scene, we're referencing the position we want it to show up, which texture key we are going to be passing in for that object. And now when I look here, I can see that I have a bunch of things going. So I'm gonna save the player. I'm gonna save my game scene. And if I go over into my browser and look, I'll see I now have an error message. And it says player is not defined at game scene. So let's go back into here and try and figure out what's going on. Well, it said at line 63, well, player is there. I see player here, I see player here. But when I look here, it's not there. So we haven't loaded it. 
So what I want to do is load entity as well as player. So now let's go here and we're probably because we moved code around we're going to have to do a little cleanup as we work our way through that document. So it's telling me I'm on line 43. If I look at line 43, it looks like I missed getting rid of one of the thises. Save it, no error message, go here, and now instead of showing the weird guy, now we get the slime. So now we know we're in business because it seems to be working. Back in game scene, if I look through, I can see that I'm working with the keys and then we're adjusting all of the player's information and I, I want to simplify it. So the only thing I want happening inside the game scene is I want to be keeping track of time and then if things are happening that are time appropriate, I want to then tell the different entities what they need to do so that I can tell whatever object needs to update itself that it needs to update. So I'm going to take all of this information that I see here in update and we're going to migrate that over into the player. Now we'll see we have keys we're working with so we're going to have to um, go and grab this key information that we have in our create so we'll have to work with that in a moment as well but first what I want to do is go and grab all of the player information and cut that out of there. Now it's a little bit scary sometimes to do that. And I'll go into the player's update statement and we're going to paste that in. Now right away it should be apparent we're going to have to get rid of a lot of players right in here because we're not using them because we're in the player class, we don't need to make a reference to the player itself in the player class. But I am going to need the key information so I can work with those. So if I go back into the game scene, as I wander up into my uh, create, and as I'm gonna play with the keys up in here, then this means I need to grab some information from this. So again, previously we used uh, cursors, not using cursors this time, we're just going to be using the keys. So I'm going to grab, I'm just going to make a note here. There's my tile map information, so then I know what I'm grabbing out of there. So now I cut that out of here, and I'm going to go into my create and decide where I want to put that inside my create. I'm going to put it after, so we have our animation information. So I'm using these comments to create dividers. So we'll paste that in. I'm going to just move it over. Commander control and square brackets allows you to adjust your indents as you work with those so that you can clean that up. So we inside the constructor and I'm going to put a comment here so I know that. So that's the end of my constructor that just helps me while I'm working so it's easier to keep track of things so I know what curly brace goes with what so it's a good practice to get into. So. We're now storing the keys, but this time we're using the key codes for things. And when we reference key codes, we can then store them as keys, but then I can reference the names of the keys that I want to work with and then reference that inside my code that I'm working with down here. Because as I work with this code, a few things that will go into that the keys part first. So if I press left or if I press A, because thinking WASD or my cursor arrow keys, 
I want A or the left arrow to move me left, and I want uh, W or my up arrow to move me up, uh, right and D for di uh, for going right, and then uh, as I almost said down, D down is down, down referring to the position of the key, not the key to make the player move down, and the down arrow key or S. So that gives me my movements as I work with those. So. Now, going back up here, uh, this where we put curly braces around this and then list the word this, it outputs it to this dot keys because it's very likely as we work with this, we're gonna make other references to things that need the word this attached to them. And when we do that, we can get rid of having to repeat the word this down in our code. So we can just say keys as part of it to clean it up so I don't have to, look in my code and see this, 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 everywhere we go. But I do know that I need to uh, alt click or option click everywhere I see player. Oh, little scroll problem going on there. So everywhere I see player, I am going to double click except when I'm referencing which animation I want to watch. And I'll hit delete twice. So now we can say this dot body and make sure we don't have players showing anywhere. But this is the same movement code that we used previously where we kept track of our previous velocity and then we moved things, slowed it down. This is one way to do it. We may be migrating our movement code into a state system as we advance our game because that will give us ultimately some more flexibility as we work with it. Now it's good I decided to scroll down a little bit more because I forgot that we had these down here for setting the idle frames. Now the thing about it is, and we'll be looking at some other ways that we may go about this. Um, whoops, apparently, oh I held. Um, command instead of alt when I was trying to multi-select. But um, if we had idle animations instead of idle frames, we could then be telling that idle animation to play instead of just telling it to go to a specific idle frame. Now the reason that we're using it instead of just listing the number here is one, it makes it a little bit easier to read. Two, it makes this code more usable because then this part doesn't have to change. I only have to update my uh, the idle frame numbers when I assign or create that variable object. So um, tell us me we got some unhappiness at player 64. So let's wander up and find out where is player 64 here and see what is going on. So examining line 64, we're setting our variable keys equal to our player class input keyboard keys, but the player doesn't take input because the player is a sprite game object. The player is not a scene. Only scenes can take input. So we need to make reference to our scene. So it's really important when you get an error message to look at where that's occurring, look at what is on that line of code and try and figure out logically what is causing the problem. And now I saved it, I can see the error message, error message went away and, and we're not getting any movement yet. And we're not getting any movement yet and it makes sense because while we put all of this code in the player's update, if I look in game scene, it's wandering to update, what happens inside of update? Absolutely nothing. So we could simply go this.player.update. So if we tell the player to update, let's see, no error messages, good. Click here to make it active and uh, let's see, player line number 124. Let's figure out what's going on at line 124 inside the player. So it's telling me uh, TH is not defined. So I'm thinking I have a typo going on there at line number 124. So if you can split your screen enough to keep your error messages up when you go back and forth, that can be a really useful way. Oh yeah. So if I look here, 
th set frame yeah that's going to be uh, problematic let's try again all right so we're here up down right and cannot read anims on line 106 so again we're going to keep finding these where we probably have some well and i left player in there so i missed one of my players when i was doing my deleting save again let's go left up right down a w d s so now we have w s d arrow keys so i can actually be using both hands at the same time to control my sprite and it's animating. So we have the player. We've made a player class. The player class is extending the entity. We have greatly cleaned up our main scene class so it doesn't have near as much stuff happening in it. So it's significantly more organized by separating this out. But we have to remember to do certain things. Use the error codes to guide you when you do it such as remembering every time we add a new class, we're going to have to add it to our index. Then, if we add any additional features into Entity, we'll have to make sure we save that. As we extend classes, we'll have to work with that. And we will have to instantiate those classes correctly using the main program code.